This is the language of business with Greg Stoller. You can hear it, but not see it. Yet the sounds permeate nearly every aspect of our lives, from when we wake up to when we go to bed, in our car, home, and office. John Garabedian has been perfecting brands for well over 50 years in 150 markets across the United States. We're joining him today on Cape Cod, and welcome to the Language of Business. It's a pleasure to be here. So how did you get your first job at 17 years old being a DJ? I went looking for it. I was a senior in high school. I took a couple days off and decided I wanted a job in radio. And I hopped in my car and drove around to every radio station within 50 miles of Boston and had a little tape I put together. and. That's it. I got hired at this little station in Milford, Mass, to do Saturday and Sunday. And nothing changes but the date. I'm still doing Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> You're, of course, referring to your nationwide show, Open House Party, which we'll get to later. But help our viewers to understand, how did you parlay a weekend job into eventually becoming a program director and then the owner of multiple radio stations? You will go to work every day. I mean, that's what you do. You work at it. And I fell in love with radio at an early age. So how do you connect a brand then to a radio station? The way you brand anything, I mean, you first of all start with a name. The name has to be something that will be memorable. The name has to be something that reflects what the product is and appeals to the target user. And then you have to deliver the product, uh, make sure the product suits the target audience, and then let people know about it. Talk to us about Open House Party, which is broadcast over the weekend, nationwide distribution. How did you start it? How does that contribute to your own brand or the station's brands that it's broadcast on? In great marketing and sales, you learn to solve problems. If you solve a problem for somebody, you put a price on it, and if it's reasonable, they'll pay the price to solve the problem. And the problem in radio was weekends sucked. Weekend radio programming was, you know, 19 year old kids who couldn't put two sentences together, uh, you know, just sounding crappy and uh, in, in most formats. So I happened to be at a party um, that Warner Brothers Records was having in Boston. All the usual characters were there, including Sonny Joe White from Kiss 108. So he approached me. He said, uh, I've been meaning to give you a call. How'd you like to do a weekend show on Kiss 108 like you used to do on WBCN, which I had helped. Uh, propel from the one five share to a nine share uh, back in the early 80s. And he, I said, well, what do you need me for? I said, why don't you get some college kids? He said, well, that's what we have right now. He said, we have great ratings during the week, but on the weekends we really drop off. I said, well, you know, I, I know what your problem is. You can't get good part-timers because if they're part-timers and they get to be any good, someone hires them away full-time. He said, yeah. I said, we now have satellites. Why not produce a big national party show? People love parties. People work all week for their weekend. And on the weekend, they want to have fun and celebrate. He said, well, what would it be? I said, well, you have, first of all, superstar guests every week. You can promote it all week. Coming up this weekend, big name guest. Uh, you have a live studio audience. You have 800 lines, so people can call in from all over the country. You have the interaction with the audience, which is fun and exciting. And, of course, a superb party host, me. <laughs> September 5th, 1987, we launched on KISS. And when the fall book came out, we had a 14-H share on a six-share radio station, which was not only the highest share for the week on KISS, but the highest share for any day part on any radio station in the Boston market. We're joining you today on Cape Cod, your offices, which houses four radio stations. Why have you chosen to invest in radio stations right now? One simple reason, because it's fun. I love radio. When Nassau Broadcasting went bankrupt, and they offered the Cape Cod cluster for sale, there were two stations, Pixie 103 and Frank FM. Pixie is the legendary heritage, 25-year classic rock station on the Cape. It's a great station, well-respected, well-listened to. Frank FM is about eight years old. Um, it is a We Play Anything station, which was a sort of a fad format that came in five or six, seven years ago. Frank was on, had two transmitters, on 93.5 and 101.1. The reason for that was the 93.5 transmitter was, here's Cape Cod, Provincetown, Hyannis, the transmitter was out here, and only was 3,000 watts, and only got to about here. 
101 was down here in Mashpee and only got to about here. So to cover the whole cape, they put them together. Well, the problem, being an engineer was an advantage because having the 93.5 over here was stupid. Why do they have it down here? <laughs> so we did some research and studying. We found a transmitter site that would work for the FCC to move. And we applied and got permission to move it closer to the Mid-Cape. So now, 93.5 could become Frank FM on its own and carry the whole Cape. Uh, and then that freed up 101.1 for something else. Well, the biggest hole in radio on Cape Cod is Top 40. So it was a natural. So what are we going to call it? We tried coming up with names, Hot, which I thought was kind of immature. Hot sounds like, oh, it's hot. It's Paris Hilton. But the name I thought was just made sense is just put a letter with it. Why 101? Why not? So we called it Y101, that's the brand. And then it came to 98.7. I found out it was owned by a guy who lived up in Medfield. He bought it at an FCC auction, which is how they hand channels out these days. And we worked a deal out and I bought it from him and put it on the air. And Steve McVie and I said, well, what do we program it with? And we instantly knew. 35% of the Cape population is over 60. And of the 356 cities and towns in Massachusetts, five of the seven towns with the highest median age are in the lower Cape. So, and that audience was underserved. Are there any economies of scale by owning four stations together, or do oh, they just happen? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And because everything's automated today, you can have a very small staff and use voice tracking, which we pioneered back in the early 70s, um, to have announcers who, you know, basically they do something else, but this is, they do this. Thank you, John. John Garabedian, radio station owner and on-air personality extraordinaire. Coming up, you should see what these folks consider business casual. Coming up, how does your PR change as you build your brand as the language of business continues?